Hello. Welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I'm doing a book review of My Darling Dreadful Thing by Joanna Van Veen. This is a book that came out May 14th, uh, 2024 by Poison Pen Press. <laughs> it's a horror historical fiction. I received this art from Neck Alley in exchange for a fair review. My Darling Dreadful Thing is the ultimate unreliable narrator novel. If you love being unsure whether something did or did not really happen in a book, this book delivers that 100%. What is it about? In a world where the dead can wake and walk among us, what is truly real? Ruth Beckman has a spirit companion only she can see. Ruth, strange, corpse-like, and dead for centuries, is the only good thing in Ruth's life, which is filled with sordid backroom seances organized by her mother. That is, until wealthy young widow Agnes Noop attends one of these seances and asks Ruth to come live with her at the crumbling estate she inherited upon the death of her husband. The manor is unsettling, but the attraction between Ruth and Agnes is palpable. So how does someone end up dead? Roos is caught red-handed, but she claims the spirit is the culprit. Dr. Montague, a psychologist tasked with finding out whether Roos can be considered mentally fit to stand trial, suspects she created an elaborate fantasy to protect her from really what really happened. But Roos knows spirits are real. She's loved one of them. She'll have to prove her innocence and her sanity, or lose everything. Oddly, a second book this week with a woman main character who is both an unreliable narrator and one with whom you're not entirely sure is mentally sound. Albeit, this book functions in an entirely different way than The Redemption of Morgan Wright. <laughs> if you've ever had the pleasure of reading The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, if not, you totally show this book's awesome. Um, my Darling Jeffrey Thing is essentially an homage to it. We have a similar concept in that it's a young woman sent to a secluded place where her sanity begins to unravel, though the essence of that insanity is what is of a different nature than in James's book. In truth, we are pretty much told to invoke the turn of the screw when going into the book, given the epigraph at the start. In this novel, we have Ruse, the main character, being interviewed by a doctor who is fairly certain she has either schizophrenia or a dissociative identity disorder, though being 1950s, his understanding of these things is a bit different from today. These interviews and epigraphs serve to frame the story as, as then we have chapters, which is most of the novel, probably like a good 90% of it, of Ruse telling what happened to her in segments. It goes in chronological order. We are already aware of what has transpired to some of the other characters, but why is the reason the doctor believes Ruse is mentally ill? What's incredibly well done about this novel is something I will talk about at the end because it's not really a spoiler, but it's like kind of a spoiler. So I figured I would just leave it at the end as a warning. So I'm going to go into stuff that is not spoilers right now. While the story is fun in the unreliable narrator sense, it is definitely not a fun novel in that it's very bleak. Ruse is a traumatized, abused young woman, and her new friend is also not in the best state of mind. Yet Ruth's trauma is an integral part of the story and is why she's so close with Ruth. Ruth, thankfully, adds some levity to the story in that she makes acerbic, often amusing comments. There's also a scene in the middle of the novel which had me almost laughing because it was so incredibly absurd. Not in like a bad way. <laughs> it's dark and creepy and tension filled, but it still had me like very amused in a kind of a dark humor sort of way. <laughs> it actually really helped to kind of kind of give the story a bit of momentum because the story is it's not depressing, but it's it's very kind of, it's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of kind of sad, kind of hard to read stuff going on. You know, there's no sunshine in this novel. So that kind of wacky kind of part in the middle really kind of helped kind of <laughs> with the tone a bit. <laughs> The characterization of Ruth is fantastic. Because her first person chapters are framed by the interviews, we approach reading those chapters almost from the mindset of psychoanalyzing her ourselves, which I thought was fun. You know, if I could go back to school or do a different career, I think I really would love to be a psychologist. The problem is I would have to talk to people suffering from like some pretty horrific stuff and I'm easily kind of triggered by certain topics. So I don't know if I can handle that, but I've always been really interested in psychology. So anyway, I found this really, really fun because of that. Basically, we watch what she does and see how every little thing ties back to her trauma, to her desire to keep the first good thing she's ever had. It's very immersive in that regard and keeps you rather riveted. 
Likewise, the setting is gothic in the extreme with a rundown mansion in the bogs with a dying sister-in-law as well. <laughs> it has very Crimson Peak vibes in a way. If you like gothic, you'll love this. There's also a big LGBT plus element, which I enjoyed. And also one of the characters is a person of color, which we don't often see in gothic stories. So I thought that that was a, a good inclusion as well. And yeah, I just, there was a lot, there's a lot to love about this book. The tone and atmosphere is also excellent. You know, it's very dark and menacing and you felt for poor Roos the entire time. The novel is absolutely entrancing. I had a fever of 103 when I was reading it. I was lying in my bed, you know, uh, uh. Um, but I was not able to stop reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I would read it for a bit and then I would like die and then I would read it some more. I basically figured in my fever that I wanted to know what happened at the end before I died. <laughs> I get very loopy when I'm sick and I'm always like convinced that I'm dying and I'm like I'm it's the end of me. <laughs> it's the end of me and my husband's like you have a fever. I'm like no no I'm, I'm on my deathbed. <laughs> Okay, so are you folks ready for the spoiler not spoiler? It's one of the best things about the novel, so I have to talk about it. So if you're if you don't want to know anything at all about this book before going into it, don't listen to this and thank you for watching. If you don't really care or you think you won't remember by the time you get to it, then totally check it out because it is one of the best things about the book. The entire time, even at the end of the book, we are never really sure, just like the turn of the screw, whether Ruth actually exists. The novel expertly lays out the evidence for both interpretations so that you can't definitively say whether she was experiencing hallucinations or some part of dissociative identity disorder or whether the ghosts were in fact real. So much of it from her mother's seances to certain physical things that happen depend on Rue's explanations, of which we cannot trust. This is also reinforced by explanation of things I found odd, like how ghosts can touch things, which make these things make sense. But do they make sense for reality or for Rue's reality? We can't ever be sure, and that's the best thing about this book. Honestly, for a turn of the screw homage, I think it absolutely nailed it. This was an excellent debut, and I would be very, very interested in what this author is gonna write next. So thank you again to NetGalley for the very late approval. <laughs> it's funny because if I get an approval, you know, less than two weeks before the book comes out, generally I'm like, I can't, I can't fit it in. But this one, I was just like, I really wanna give this one a shot. And I'm very glad that I did because I, uh, I really, really liked it. So yeah, uh, thanks for watching and catch you later, I guess. <laughs>